school together we went to at the same time we were in junior high school state junior high state and then one day we decided that we wanted to put a group together and being that uh, a lot of the kids around the area were singers it was very easy for us to put a group to together because it was nothing but singers around so uh, you know we got together myself Jimmy Merchant Joe Negroni Sherman Garns and Frankie Lyman and that's how the group was when you much. guys first got together though Frankie wasn't a member of the group was it no, Frankie wasn't in the group at the time because uh, we had somebody else in his place. But how, how Frankie and we got together was that we were doing a talent show in State Junior High School. That's where we met Frankie Lyman. Frankie Lyman had his own group at the same time and we had ours and that's how we met. Now Frankie was there to play the bongos in right. his group, right? And you guys saw him. And, and, but you guys have been practicing and rehearsing and singing with your own group, and you really weren't looking for somebody else. You guys were happy the way you were, the four, the quartet. Well, I guess I guess you can say that. Um, uh, like Herman said, Frankie had his own little combo, if you will. He played bongos. Uh, he had a guy playing sticks. His brother was in the group. He played congo, and. Uh, he was a rising neighborhood moving into the vocal group scenario without really even knowing it. Like Herman said, the vocal group craze had broken out. And it was a craze and everybody was doing it on, in every corner. And like what I... What corner did you guys sing out? I lived on 156th Street between, between Amsterdam and Broadway. And Herman lived on 165th Street. School. From school. Further north. Yeah, further, further north. north. Across the street, actually, from the school. And Frankie lived next to the, the building next to the school. And Sherman lived on the corner. So the three of them already were in the neighborhood. The same block. Um, Joe Negroni lived on 154th Street. Not 155th the Street. Street. He was by the same Yeah, 155th Street. 154th Street. 53rd. 153rd. I was on 56. So we all had this vocal group thing going on in our heads. And you're just young and kids. Yeah, you're 14 and 15. It's yeah. just like um, you, you, you walk into a, uh, a scenario with a lot of young kids and everybody's got basketball in their mind. Yeah. But in our neighborhood, you walk around us, we all had singing on our mind. We all wanted to be a singing group in some way, shape, or form. We didn't know that we were going to come together and we didn't know what would happen just a few months later, a year later. Not even a year. So, the little bongo player, you find, you got him to join your group. You were on the bill, the Cadillacs was on that bill. The Cadillacs, right? They were singing uh, at the Stitt Junior High that night? Well, the Cadillacs weren't on the, around in that area. It was uh, the Valentine. 
Richard Barry? Richard yeah. Barry. That's who it was. The Cadillacs did come into the picture, but in that area, that was it was late. Richard Barry. Mm -hmm. Right, during that period, uh, we used to rehearse at night time during the center at night, from 7 to 10 o'clock at night. And uh, we all had our own private room. And that, everybody used to rehearse right around uh, at that, that time at the at State Junior High School. And uh, we had a great time. We rehearsed every night pretty much. And during the day, or the, when the school wasn't available, we used to rehearse on our stoop. And uh, a lot of times, being the Frankie lived across the street, he used to be right there listening to us. One time we were writing, I want you to be my girl, putting what I want you to be. You wrote that song, didn't you? Yeah, we put it together, and uh, we were writing it, and uh, Frankie was sitting right there listening to us. I was doing the lead at that time, and then he, he liked it so much that he said, let me try it. So I let him try it, and it was so good that we asked him to come to rehearsal that evening. And that's before why the things going on. Oh, that was before why you pulled yes. up. So we're talking early '56 or late '55. Well, we're talking 1955. 55. The group comes together early 1955, and right away we're making up songs, but mainly singing all the songs that's on the radio. Painted picture the, the by, uh, by the Spaniels. Good night, sweetheart. Um, why don't you write me by the why don't Jacks? You, why don't you write me? Um, uh, Climax Fatters, uh, That's What You're Doing to Me, yes. and the Dominoes. Yes, that. Yes. So we had these four or five songs that we sang over and over again. And then uh, the Capitals was another vocal group. And, and I started getting some ideas and shared it with Herman with I Want You to Be My Girl. And we came up with I Want You to Be My Girl. And it was a slamming song. And Frankie comes in. Uh, just a couple of months later, around June of that year. 55. Yeah, 1955. Just a couple of, a few months later. And remember, we got six months to go before we become hit stars. Right. <laughs> but you don't know it, though. We don't know it yet. We, we don't know it. So, so Richard Barrett is now in the neighborhood, and they tell, uh, uh, people tell him about us. He's living over the, uh, the, the neighborhood grocery store. He has an apartment over the store. Frankie worked in that store and Herman used the store and Herman's mother and Sherman's family used the store and we would go in and out and Frankie would just check us out and he was fresh of course. Fresh, I mean he was a fresh kid because he was like, um, he seemed older than his age but then when he seen us singing on the corner he would come in and put his Two cents in, three cents, four oh. cents, five cents, one hundred percent. He just wanted to be one of us. Yeah. 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 But he was the youngest kid. He was yeah. driven like all of us to yeah. sing. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right, so you bring Frankie in, and then how do you get to meet George Goldner? How does, does Richard Barry take you Well, R Richard Barry, uh, being that we used to rehearse at the center at night, said, uh, I want you guys to rehearse. Being that rehearse. Richard Barry was there, he, 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 we met, he met us, and then he asked us to as he said, continue rehearsing for a couple of months, and then I'm going to bring you guys downtown to meet the, the producers of the record company. Where's downtown? I, oh, downtown is Times Square in New York City, 50th Street. So you young kids are going to go down to Times Square. 42nd Street. 42nd Street. Because that's yeah, where that, his office was. That's where the office was. Yes. And you're going to meet who? Oh, at George the time, we were going to meet George Goldner. Did you know George before you got there? No. no. You didn't no. know who he was? No. You just knew you're going downtown and you're going to meet a record executive. Yeah, Richard, Richard Barry. Richard was going to introduce us. To okay, so so you go downtown, in, with, you're with Richard Barrett, and you're going to meet record executive George Goldner. George, yeah, right. What are you going to sing for? Yeah, Singing, yeah. Um, um, That's What You're Doing to Me. Why Don't You Write Me. Why Don't You Write Me. By the Jacks. By the Jacks. But pretty much a few things, that, a few records, uh, songs that were that would play on the radio. Did he like it? Well, he said, uh, he said, do you have any originals? That's what he said. Frankie was cute. And Frankie could sing first tenor, and Frankie stood out. And so he said, I wanted this kid to sing to himself. Frankie had no lead songs in the group. I think he sang a duet with Joe Negroni. Oh, we on, one thing with you? Yes. A duet with you. So um, he said, did you have any originals? So that's when we sang, I want you to be my girl. With, with, with Frankie singing the lead on it. Okay. He said, do you have anything else? So we said we was working on, on, on a song that somebody had given us some letters. So he said, okay, at this point, I would like for Frankie Lyman to become the lead. I'm going to record you guys. And 
he told Richard Barrett to take us and practice us up and bring us back to see how we sound because he's going to record us. And that's how we got the recording deal. It was a live rehearsal. Um, and uh, George, at that a point, at that point, said when he told us, you know, if you have any originals, he said, work on the originals. And that's when we came back with Why the Fools Fall in Love. Why the Fools Fall in Love. You sang that for George Golder? No, we did not. We sang another original, I Want You to Be My Girl, and we were working on another song called Please Be Mine. Those two songs. Said, Please Be Mine is just a simple, straight doo-wop song. It was just background harmonies, basic background harmony, with Frankie making up some lead words. That's really all that was. And I Want You to Be My Girl was a little bit more tougher because we had a, a definite idea about that that we got from the Capitals. And, but he asked, he, he told uh, uh, Richard Barrett at that point, uh, you know, let Frank, I, w I want Frankie Lyman to sing lead from now on. Richie, go rehearse the boys. So you guys were told to go home and go come back, back yes. after you rehearse. Then what happened? You went back and rehearsed. How so, long were you gone? Well, we, we went back three months later. Three months? Yes, or between two and about two and a half months, pretty much. See, Richard Barrett basically oversaw the rehearsals, preparing us for the studio to actually record. And he called up, he called up uh, George Goldman and said, they're ready. We probably went down there one more time for George to hear us. And George said, okay, and gave us a date to record, yes, something, yes, like when, yeah. something like that. Something like that. So you went back, what, around Thanksgiving time? Oh, um, Yes, yeah, yeah the, the, beginning, the beginning of December. Yeah, I was beginning say, of December. Uh, no, no. You know why? Because we recorded the beginning of September, uh, December. It was the first weekend in December. Just to set the record straight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. November, November is the time when we went back for the final, uh, for the final, it's I guess, really, rehearsal. Rehearsal, audition, really. George, mm -hmm. we're ready. Okay. See, remember, right. the, 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 the Why the Fools Fall in Love was actually recorded the first weekend of December. Right. Okay, yeah, so... 1955. Yeah. 1955. If you look back in history, Rosa Parks, back then, that was when she wouldn't move from her seat on the bus, December 1st of 1955. And that's when the Montgomery bus boycott began with Martin Luther King. And here are you young teenagers now, going to move into the music world, and we're going to be seeing Fats Domino, and we're going to be seeing racial racial integration in our music all of a sudden because you can't deny this is great music sure. all of a sudden the white audiences are going to start buying this music even though of course uh, there were a lot of forces throughout the south and even the mid-south and sometimes in the north people say don't listen to that music but you couldn't turn your ear away from great music and you guys were about to enter music history through this great song tell us what happened you go into the studio. Tell me about these young teenagers. Well, we, we went into the studio and uh, we rehearsed, uh, we recorded rather, and uh, we took about 15 or 18, uh, 18 take, takes, pretty much. So it didn't happen like that? No, it was it took about, a while. Yeah, it took about 18 takes. What was the name of your group when you went into the studio? I think the uh, Cookmobile at the time. Yeah, you were the Cook Devilles at yeah. one time. Yeah, Cook Devilles, right. It, it was there. It, and then you yeah. became the premier. It was, it was the Ermans. It was the Ermans, the uh, Premiers, then right. the Coupe de Ville's, which came after the Cadillacs. Yeah. 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 So you go into the studio, you young kids. It takes you a couple dozen takes to get this song right. Right. And then George and what, Richard Ferris give you a new name? Who gave, or Jimmy Wright? Oh, it was yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy Wright, Wright that mm -hmm. came up with, uh, oh, why don't you leave those teenagers alone and let them do what they know <laughs> how to do best? Is that what he said? And that's, yes, the teenager. He used the word teenager. Who that is, name stuck. Who was Jimmy Wright? Well, Jimmy Wright was uh, the the the, the, horn player. Player, the, yeah. the saxophone Sax. player in, in the in the band. And uh, that's he, he did all the arranging. Was, he did yeah. all the arranging and he did the conducting and he right. set all the music straight. Right. And he loved you guys and said, "Leave those teenagers alone." He said, "You know, like George Golden was saying, yeah. you know, I don't like I don't like the name of the group that they're using. We need another name. What do you think, Jimmy?" You know, he asked Jimmy Wright. He said, "Well, hey, hey, they're teenagers. Call them teenagers." <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. yeah, it was a good marketing it's tough, it's tough. thing because uh, George Golden, he was an, a marketing expert. He could pick out hits. He made he made he made hits. 
he, he was a good marketer and he saw that the teenagers would work and he told us that you guys are going to be big stars. Really? He saw that? And he probably foresaw that we were going to be really hitting the young world hard because we were young kids and we had, we had a piece of music there that was beyond the so-called doo-wop thing. It, was, it had a pop commercial sound to it and he felt, I think, that it was going to go beyond the R&B category. And it did. It went. It went across the world yeah, the to music, the masses. The, the, our music was totally different. I mean, he, he more than likely saw that, and that's why he came out with those ideas that he just mentioned. That's Jimmy exactly just it. Mentioned. So you record the song in. Now I know your birthdays are both in February. Okay. Right. And that song in February of '56 hit, right? Boom. I would say True. before that, probably. Uh, well, I, in January, it came out the first week in January. It the came third, out the third. The third. Yeah. It, well, it, George Golden said he was mailing it out. No, here's what he said. He told us that it was going to be released a week from Christmas. And what's a week from Christmas? New Year's Eve. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So we heard it on the third when we went back to school. Oh, you the, saw, yeah. uh, you're going down the hall and you hear some girl that's singing the, that's your song. Already. And, and what do you say? You stop her in the hallway. She couldn't breathe. Just like they can today. <laughs> like you can't right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, here's your young kids walking through the hallway in school, yeah. okay? And you hear this girl saying, that's me, okay, on the radio. Really? Oh, and you're 15 years old. Well, you're about to be 16. Okay. So this thing goes to the top of the charts. Mm -hmm. Then what? Then what happens for the teenagers? Well, instantly, right there... Right, soon thereafter, uh, we, we started working. Uh, they, they, we, our first game, we went to Connecticut along with the uh, Cadillacs. There were and Fats we were, Domino. Fats Domino and uh, the, turbans. the... The Turbans. The Turbans, right, right. And that was our first show. And, and that's when they kicked out the stage light, from, right? From there on, we Eleven never stopped. Eleven kids got arrested we never at that stopped. concert. Because, of, wow. uh, because they went crazy. Right. And, and that's when that's when a psychologist said that this rock and roll is going to be the death of our death, children. Yeah. It's, it's going to be terrible. I mean, this rock and roll, <laughs> what's it doing? And, and you guys are helping cause these problems mm. to society. Terrible. It was it was like none of none of y'all you know none of y'all guys bring that up. Reminds me of the the first uh, Alan Freed show in. Where, um, Paramount? Paramount? No, 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 not that one. Before we came oh, to New York. Oh, at Moondog Coronation Ball. Yeah. That's 52. what we did when we came out with that. It was bang. Yeah. The Coronation Ball. We, we took it another, we took it to the next step. Yes. So you guys now are in school. But all of a sudden the world's looking for this kind of music and they're looking for you. And George Goldner and Alan Freed are saying, hey, there's a market for these kids. You gotta go. You gotta go now while it's hot. But you got school. What are you doing? Well, private um, school. They took us. Did you private school? They put us in private school. Yeah, school for young professionals. Okay. Where you can go to school while you're in town, and uh, if you're traveling, you have a tutor with you. You brought a tutor with and, you. Uh, yes. When we're in town, we go to the building to to, to to learn. But when we're on the road, they supplied us. A uh, management supplied us with. Um, uh, what do you call the teachers on the road? Yeah, tutors, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. teaching Tut your kids. Tutors, tutors, so you yeah. kids never got away from school. Mm -hmm. No. no because we you, went to guys, you guys were always touring. I mean, you guys didn't really go home. Am I right? We got our high school diplomas on the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the summer of 56 now, Gail Storm, right. Gloria Mann, and the Diamonds all copied yeah. Why Do Fools Fall in Love. Yeah. Of course, it didn't have the same impact. It didn't have the same success. No. But all the white artists wanted to do it because, hey, if these kids can do it, we can do it. And we all want in on this. So take me through the summer of 56 in your recording. What are you guys doing? Going back and forth in the studio, back and forth on the road? You guys are still only kids and you're missing your childhood. Well, in 1956, we went out on three tours. Three tours in one yeah. year? How long were the tours? The tours were 90 days each. So you're talking 270 days you young teenagers are on the road. It's 56. Did you? Did your families recognize you? Did they know who you were? Because you're just kids and you're growing. <laughs> well, uh, we, we, most of the time we were out of town, like you said. And, yeah. Uh, I'm sure they did recognize yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, when you came home. And when you came home with that paycheck. But not only that, uh, I remember one time we, we did a 
Alan Free show. Uh, we left, we spent there 10 days, and then at, no sooner, at the last show, we got on a, on a limousine, went to the airport, and went to Panama. You did two cities. You went to Panama City, and then, then you played another place in Panama, but you were gone in It was Pan 10 days in, in Panama. Yeah, but you were gone for 10 days. And, and this was the life you were leading. And then right yeah, after that, we went to England. That's yes. the first time you went overseas then? Yes. That was the first time you played the London Palladium? Right. Yes. Okay. With the premier theater, the premier venue throughout the world. Yes. Here, here are the teenagers from Harlem. And you'd sing in Why Do Fools yes. Fall in Love? And I Want You to Be My Girl. How about ABCs of Love? Well, that was one of them too. Yeah. I sang you, that. you recorded that? You, yeah. You, you, oh, that, oh, yeah. That was in 56. We recorded all those songs. Yeah. Why Do Fools Fall in Love? Uh, Promise to Remember. ABCs of love. I'm not a juvenile delinquent. Right, juvenile delinquent. Yeah. And no. teenage love. Okay. And don't forget that they were all two-sided hits too. Yes. They had the ballads, Out in the Cold Again, The Creation of Love, I'm Not a know it Paper Castles. Share, yeah. Paper Castles, yeah. Out in the Cold Again. How many songs did you and Frankie, as Frankie Lyman and the teenagers, record? 16 singles. Okay, 32 yeah. songs. And they, right. and they put them into an album at the end of the year. And when you first came out, what was the name of the group? Was it called the Teenage Teenagers featuring Frankie Lyman? Originally, it was uh, the Teenagers. The Teenagers. Right. Later on, it became the the company. They decided to change it, and they put the Teenagers featuring, featuring Frankie, Frankie Lyman. Lyman. And then it became Frankie Lyman and, and the, the Teenagers. teenagers. Right. So there were really three different names over the 18 months that you guys were together. And then it became <laughs> Frankie Lyman. <laughs> <laughs> That's after he left because the group. We're at the end of 1956, and you guys are invited to be part of a movie. Yes. Okay, with Alan Free. Yes. Tell me about that. What was the name of the movie? The name of the movie was uh, Rock, Rock, Rock. Rock, Rock, Rock. Yes. And you guys were going to appear in this movie, and you're going to sing a couple of songs. I baby, Baby, and I'm Not Doing yeah, Another Language. Those songs yeah. sang in the, in the movie, yeah. Where was... Your part, you didn't get to go to California for the movie. You did yours here in New York. In the Bronx. Yeah. Studio. Studio. Studios in the Bronx. Yes. I don't remember the name of the studios right now. When you did it then, you didn't really see any of the other performers because yours was isolated. Yours was here in New right. York City. So, right. Exactly. And then you saw it come out in the movie and you guys were on the big silver screen. Yes. You kids, you teenagers are now movie stars because you were recording stars, now movie stars. But you were also TV stars. Yes. You appeared on TV. Your first, your first appearance was with Frankie Lane. Yes. Yes, right. right. It's exciting. But for then one though, I remember we had we went to Hollywood New, in California, and uh, that's where we did the show, NBC Studios, Hollywood and Vine. And I remember getting uh, being on being on the avenue, and it was 80 degrees, and uh, I, and this is December. And so, I'm, so I'm, I'm from New York, so when I was there in December and it was 80 degrees, and I saw this person acting as playing the part of Santa Claus, I thought it was uh, <laughs> somebody that was crazy because the weather was 80 and I'm not used to that. I wasn't used to it. Well, you're thinking it's summertime. It, it was summertime, right. Mm. Yeah, in your mind it was summertime. But, yeah, right, but in New York it was freezing. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And I saw this man <laughs> dressed up as Santa Claus and I thought, so wait, what's going on here? Then it dawned on me that it was, it was. Uh... So what was it like being on the Frankie Lane show? And I'm going to tell you when I ask you that question, when you answer it, I'm going to be playing the Frankie Lane show split screen. Okay, yeah, right. I'm going to have you guys answering the question, and I'm going to have the Frankie Lane show showing with you. Yeah. So, tell me, what was it like, you young teenagers, being on TV on the Frankie Lane show? Well, it was amazing because uh, we had done a lot of those. Um, record hops on the East Coast where you go in and you lip sync a lot of times like Dick Clark we weren't on Dick Clark but similar to Dick Clark where you, you lip sync and they had dances while you lip sync but now we're going to California to do a live performance and they were saying the famous words was coast to coast so now we know we're going to perform one time and it's going to be seen all over the United States. So to me, I said, whoa, this is big. And then all the big stars, Deborah Paget, Jane Russell, you know, Frankie now, Lane. Course, Nelson Riddle was the band. Nelson Riddle was our band. Yeah, he had the NBC yeah. Orchestra. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. 
and Nat King Cole sitting on the side watching us in the studio with a little baby in his arms. You know who that was? I mean, heard of her, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was a live program, mm -hmm. and I remember you guys came out, and here's Frankie Lane kind of uh, give and take with you guys, you know, the back and forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he says something to the effect of, uh, well, you want me to get lost. And Frankie says, well, that's the idea. <laughs> and then he leaves and you guys then become the teenagers and do do what the teenagers do on live TV. I like the opening words. Uh, I don't remember the exact words, but he said this, something like the sensation of rock and roll. This group is something called the sensation of this new music called rock and roll and to me um, that has lasted through today Be because we were we were um, the first boy band if you will but not only the first boy band that became superstars but the first boy band that that started so many vocal groups that were kids yes, performing yeah. that before us, music itself, the recording industry was adults. All adults. Aimed Pretty at right. adults. Yeah. But now here comes these five kids. And all of a sudden the music slowly but surely became an industry with kids. Right through to the day, Justin Bieber. I mean, you can go back to Boys to Men, the Osmonds, the Jacksons, but right through to today. And you know Bruno Mars, uh, uh, New Direction, or whatever that group's name is. Uh, yes, it is. One Direction. There's yeah. another group called uh, Mindless Behavior. All kids. And it started here, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, and Why the Fools Fall in Love. So we didn't know it, but you guys were starting a revolution. You guys were starting a revolution that said, "Kids, children, this is for you. This is of you. It's by you, and it's." For you, I'm visiting exactly. your time. Yeah, and you guys just went with it. Okay, so now give us a recording deal today. <laughs> well, no, your great grandfathers can't do it. But he's right. Okay, but, he's, but this is but this is where it began, and you guys are the only two surviving members of this group that right. did that. Yes. That took rock and roll to the kids, and after you. Everybody followed. Everybody followed. Everybody. Even girl groups. LaBelle. Everybody became younger also. You know? Hey, well, yeah. even the Shirelles, the Chantels. Yeah. Nobody thought that kids could be yeah. singing yeah. and performing until the teenagers said, yes, we can. So, okay, we get through. Now we're on TV with Frankie Lane. And then we're on the screen with Rock, Rock, Rock in the 1957 hits. And when 1957 comes on, is Frankie Lyman getting a little bit too much of Frankie Lyman for the group? Does Frankie Lyman decide that he is the group? Is that what drives? We don't know that. The wedge. No, no. I, I believe that he was a fresh kid. Uh, he, Go ahead. Herman. I, 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 I say to that that uh, it wasn't Frankie's idea to, to to leave the group. It was pretty much the, the company's idea that uh, that. To do so. It was a marketing decision. Exactly. In the exactly. same way that Michael Jackson left the Jackson exactly. Five. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how it happened. Smokey Robinson left the Miracles. You know, it's something that, that happens. Diana Ross left the Supremes. Mm -hmm. All because Frank and Lyman left the teenagers. See, we spent we spent a lot of years. Um, Herman, uh, the other two originals, Jonah Groney and Sherman Gons, and myself spent a lot of years being angry at Frankie, but it wasn't his fault. It was management, it was a marketing decision to make him a Sammy Davis Jr., to make him a Frank Sinatra, you see. And just throwing the four of us away, like splitting and chopping us, chopping us away and keeping him. But nevertheless, the point is that we kept singing. We never stopped. You went with Irvin Feld on the road. True. Yeah. Okay. Right. He was see, a promoter at the time. He was a promoter. And and he was promoting because he was doing something different. Alan Freed was having concerts here, concerts there, concerts there. But, but Urban Feld put you in buses. And night after night, we went boom, 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 80 nights for right. the biggest show of stars. Yeah, we went throughout the, the whole United States. Yeah. Okay, here you are, young kids now. Young kids going down into the deep south, okay? Mm -hmm. Black kids from... Well, they called them Negroes and Coloreds back then, okay? Yes. In 1957. 
Did you ever know that you weren't allowed to go and eat in a certain restaurant because of the color of your skin? Did you know that if you tried to sleep in a hotel? Yeah, instantly. When you got there, yeah, you didn't know it before. No, we you, didn't. When no. you left New York yeah, right. City, you yeah. thought you could go where anybody else could go. Yeah. But here you are, 16 years old. I want to go eat in there. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. Why not? Because of who you are. Mm -hmm. How did that impact you as a young kid? I thought it was strange. As where, a young kid who's on TV and right. in the movies. I thought it was strange where, uh, for instance, like Bill Haley in the comments on the road with us, on tour with us, stayed at the Hilton's and the Sheridan's hotels, and we were staying at these shacks, if you will, well, you can with call rooms. That if you want to. Yeah. Yes. I mean, a hotel, but they, they were really shacks, comparatively yeah, speaking. Yeah. And um, uh, picket, picket lines around, around some of the buildings, like in, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, where um, uh, the whites are going with signs saying, you know, these black ends coming in our towns with their straight hair stealing our white girls oh, and black and white kids behind them with these signs, black and white, saying, rock and roll was here to stay, yeah. rock and roll was here to stay. And, and not only that, I remember doing shows in uh, 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 Alabama, right, where uh, we did shows in, in the afternoon for whites and in the evening for blacks. You weren't allowed to appear on some stages. The whites couldn't appear on the same stage where the Negro right. performers performed. You would be arrested if you tried to do that. Right. You know, they were very strict about that. But see, you guys are young kids, and you're coming out of New York, and you don't know about this. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is an insult in education it's at the crazy. same time. Insult. Yeah. yeah. And remember, they pulled Nat King Cole off the, at that very same stage that we performed. Uh, he had the, and you know, and, and uh, a lot of performers were going on the road and going into those cities with guns. People had guns on the buses with us. You know, the, um, the, the, um, the Clovers, um, the um, Flamingos, and those guys bought guns. The Colts, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the Drifters, the original Drifters, remember now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're talking Clyde McFadden Drifters. Yeah, yes. them, yeah. you know, uh, they had guns. Bill Pinkney. Yeah, they had yeah, guns? Yeah, yeah. Now, how do you kids, what do you mean guns? What do you have to have guns to go perform? We just want to go sing. Frankie Lane, what are you, what are you doing to me? It, this is all a shock to your 16-year-old system. Suddenly the business of show business where we were superstars overnight and getting all this attraction became a weird scenario for us as children where people had to actually go on stage with guns. That didn't, that didn't, that didn't. That was, that was weird. That was weird. Definitely. Now, we're in your dressing room because you guys got to get ready to get up on stage in a few minutes. Yeah. But before you run off, tell me a little bit about 1957, about the biggest show of stars, your tour. You said you were on stage with guys who were carrying guns because this is something totally new to you, going into the South, and you got to protect yourself with guns. Well, so, well that was something that uh, we, we had no idea about anything like that. But uh, it, it was crazy to see uh, the, the other acts having guns. We're while, talking Clyde McBatter. I'm getting ready to go on stage. I'm talking about the Colts, the Drifters, and the acts like that. I remember have them having guns with them. And they're much, old, the they're much older I, than you, though. Oh, oh yeah. You're they, young they were, kids yeah, well, with... At the time, we were, what, 15, 16, 17 years old. Yeah. And this is this was what was going on around us, and we had no idea what it was all about, but that's how it was. Yeah, yeah. And you're learning. You can't go into that restaurant. You can't go into that hotel. You have to go sleep in that shack because of who you are, the color of your skin. Another time, I remember being in uh, North Carolina, and uh, we we wanted something to eat, and uh, we couldn't go in this particular restaurant. So being that Joe was lighter and had looked pretty much white. He went into the restaurant for us and brought out the food. Howard Johnson. He got away with it. Yeah, our bus driver was a white guy. There were two buses, but our dress, our bus driver was hanging. You know, the Teen Queens was on the bus with us. Uh, the Flamingos was on the bus with us. Uh, the Clovers and um, and the Platters. Zola Taylor. And um, so. Is this where Zola meets Frankie? Or? Yeah. That's how he asked. Okay. They hung out in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, for those of you keeping score at home, this will be wife number two. Okay. Well, they never. All right, All right. Yeah, we get there. Right. I don't think that's. Well, she was fault. babysitting then. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Cougar, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But anyway, um, uh, we, we, we're going, we're in the south, and we're stopping on the road. It's late at night, and um, I, think it's the, I think the guy's name was Hank, the, 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 bus, the bus driver. He driver. said, look, the bus driver, uh, he's, he's going to take orders from everybody on the bus that's black. And on that bus, everybody was black but him. And Jonah Groney in our group looked white. And he said, Joe and I are going to go in and get everybody's orders. So him and Joe took all the orders, went in to the Howard Johnson's, and uh, got everybody through and brought it to us. I mean, it's odd, that, that but that's one, how it was done. That's, that was one experience. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after you guys get off this tour, did you go back over to England? Because there comes a time when, as you said, the group was being broken up, but it wasn't because of Frankie and it wasn't because of you guys. It was because of management. How True. did you learn? This is this is when when Goody Goody was recorded. You guys were supposed to be part of Goody Goody, right? Right. Well, we right. We, we we did record Goody Goody, but uh, later on it was we recorded without us. You recorded Goody Goody with Frankie? Yes. yes. Okay. But yeah, that we was... went to uh, when that was the, the time, the, the period when we were in England, and that's where we were supposed to record. Oh, uh, Frankie and I met the teenagers, uh, the teenagers at the London Palladium. Well, let me ask you this before we get that far. We come out in January, right? In 1956. That's when Frank. Uh, that's when Fr uh, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers hit with Why the Fools Fall in Love. Now, a year and a half later, is the end. Okay. So you're talking about 1957, June, July. The last thing we did with Frankie was in July, where we made the second movie. And we did, uh, we did an Alan Freed show, 10 days. So that was the last things that we did with Frankie Lyman, all within the 18-month period. Yeah, 18 months. The same length of time. You're talking about coming back from England. Yeah, we, never, we only went to England once. Okay. But Frankie... Well, we were there three months. Well, yeah, we were there. All right, let me, let me take you to 57. 57, Herman said we did the uh, Alan Freed show. Then we did Panama, February 57. After we come from Panama, we go to England for three months, March, April, May. Throughout the British June, the, 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 the middle of June, we come back and we do, we do another Paramount show and the movie, and that's the end of it, because we broke up in Europe. July. How did you break up and how did you learn that you were breaking up? Uh, before, we, before we go there, they take us in the studio and they tell us that we're going to record an album it's going to be entitled Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers and at London. the London Palladium. Right. So we go in and we start recording something just before we go to England. And one song we did was called Out in the Cold Again. And the other side they released with Frankie by himself. That's the beginning of the breakup. One side is Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. And the flip side, first time ever, is Frankie by himself, A Miracle in the Rain. We don't find that out until we get to Europe in, in March. I get a letter from a, a lady friend. She says, your latest song is great, Out in the Cold Again, but the other side is Frankie by himself, A Miracle in the Rain. That's when we all went crazy. We start calling up the management office, and we start saying, you know, we were kids. We were crazy, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so <laughs> we didn't like that. So um, uh, that was the beginning of the end. And you didn't hear it from Frankie. You never heard no, it. We had a meeting and Frankie told us in the meeting, in the hotel. That's how we asked. Yeah, that's how we He said, oh, yeah, well, you know, um, the group is, the, the group, uh, they're taking me from the group. I'm going to be a solo artist. We were in Europe. We were at the peak of our career. <laughs> a special performance for the Queen of England. I mean, come on. We're, we're at the peak of our career and Frankie's telling us that they're taking him out the group. I mean. Now, that's, that, to me, that yeah, was that, one that, of the major mistakes in show business. Yeah. One of the main, oh, yeah. you know, we're not talking about, you know, <laughs> Donna Ross leaving the Supremes or Climax Fatter leaving the Drifters or it's, even, uh, you know, Michael Jackson leaving the Jacksons. We're talking about Frankie Lyman at the peak of our career being separated from the group. And that was the end of it. And it ended the career of the teenagers? That, that ended the career of Frankie Lyman? That was the end of it. 
the situation it was, right, it, right, it was it, never it, the it, same it, right it, after it, that. It was never the same. Never. In fact, the one hope that I had, I'm taking you ahead now, way ahead. When Frankie Herman said that Frankie passed, and I heard it on the radio, I was working, I was driving a truck. And I heard it on the radio, and the first thought that it came to me after the death, uh, the first thought that came to me upon the death was, of course, sorrow for him to be dead. But the very next thought was that this is really, really the end. Any hope that I had of Frankie Lyman and the teenagers ever getting back, back together again, that was it. Because groups do get back together again. Some of them do. And that's a big problem with groups, you know. It's always some kind of going something going on. They don't understand what a group is. A group, a group is a group is a group that's supposed everybody works together in spite of all their and that's what and, creates and, the in spite of all their perceptions. Everybody's got a different perception in life. And perception destroyed destroy I mean Adam. His perception of what obedience was. Give me a break. So so so, so it's not unusual to see breakups in group, but that happened to the kids, and you know, then, 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 then all the other stuff, the rip, the rip off and stuff like that. But it was, it was, it was something that Herman and I did at a very young age that we're still doing today. Now, that's a blessing. Today, you guys are going to be out on stage. You're going to be up on stage in a few minutes, and you're going to be singing all these great hits back from the dawn of rock and roll that you guys helped to create. Can we come and watch? Yes, you can. Of course. Be okay. my guest. Okay, buddy. Be our guest. <laughs> He's out and out. All right. I'm going to see you out on stage in a few minutes. You guys are going to get right. dressed, right? Right So now. I probably won't recognize you when you come out of this dressing room, but I'll be looking for you. And bye. Take care of that. God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you for following us. And we're going to follow them right out on stage in a few and minutes. <laughs> okay, guys. I'll see you on stage. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, I appreciate it. I see you guys looking good. Okay, Tommy? Take care of you guys. Okay, that was great. I'll see you in a few minutes. That's great. Okay, thanks. Good job, man. Good job. Amen. Good job. 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 Good